Okay, what we're going to do tonight is I want to talk about a few things, maybe focus on a couple of Greek words. Um, because I'm, I'm really just stuck in an area that I don't want to move away from. And I was originally going to treat each of the records individually, but I realized I, I actually can't do that until I treat the big picture. And then you can go back and you can analyze one by one. Um, so this is what I want to do. Uh, we're going to be in, at least initially, we'll be in Matthew um, for tonight. And I'm only looking at just kind of a small window of time. Um, well, we're going to be camping out for a little while in chapter 26 of Matthew. But let me just make a few observations, which are, you know, you can read by these things, I can quote them, and then you have to stop for a minute and just analyze something. After Matthew 16, when Peter makes that declaration, Thou art the Christ, everything changes after that. Everything changes after that moment at Caesarea Philippi, where that declaration is made, from things that Jesus said had to happen to essentially winding down to the hours at hand. In Matthew 24 begins the um, Olivet Discourse, or the Mount of Olives Discourse, if you will. And what is kind of interesting, if you kind of take a bird's eye view from that discourse, which obviously, and then we'll be looking at chapter 26, but beginning at chapter 24, it is um, somewhat interesting. The disciples are with him, and beginning in that third verse of the 24th chapter, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And you've got two, essentially two full chapters of Jesus telling incredible things of a future time, as he's saying what has not yet happened. And if you keep going, you notice there is a complete shift in Jesus' address towards the Jews, towards the nation that he came to his own, his own received him not. There's a, a shift. And in this discourse, he's now essentially, there's no more talk of grieving over those people it is basically the meeting out of judgment, which is kind of woven in between chapters 24 and 25. You'll find it's just a sorting out of people. The, after he tells of a future time, you've got the lesson of the fig tree, and then faithful and unfaithful, the ten virgins, the talents. It's, it's a sorting out of, of the people of God. And it's kind of interesting because this whole thing culminates, um, again, in the two categories, the, the last a uh, few verses of chapter 25 when he basically distinguishes between uh, the, the wicked, those that will go away into everlasting punishment, and the righteous into life eternal. So it's kind of one of those things. If you're just reading the Olivet Discourse, you see the change that has already occurred in Jesus' talk with his disciples. There's no more grieving over a lost nation, no more grieving over his own. He's now basically the woes have been pronounced, a future discourse has been addressed, and then now we're in the 26th chapter. So I just gave you the background real quick in a nutshell. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, at the end of this discourse, he said unto his disciples, you know that after two days, this is kind of interesting, after two days, is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then, ass then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people under the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas. Now, they consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him, but they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now, stop right there. 
I had to do some some scribbling in my Bible to sort this out because I realized when I was reading this, the introduction to this section, that this is not necessarily lined up in right chronology. And so I want you to focus first on something. The key word in that 26th chapter opening, when Jesus had finished saying these things, and Look at verse 3, then assemble together the chief priests. So there's something that is happening here, and I'll say it like this. The first five verses are a statement and the continuation of that, if you will, of, of that thought process we'll take up in verse 17. Verses 6 through 16 is an interpolation for the purpose of explaining something else. So it's kind of interesting. The, the chronology, when we read it, we, we have this fatal flaw of reading things and thinking we're reading them and they're, they've been put in order. But this is not actually in order. And in fact, let me elaborate before you, you jump to conclusions on what I'm saying. There's something that is happening in this passage. If you line this passage up, Jesus says two days and then the Passover. This same event occurs in John's Gospel, and if you're not careful to line things up in John's Gospel, it would be chronicled as six days before the Passover. So that's why I said the chronology is off, but it's not an error. It's how we are reading it, and there are, there are actually two things going on at the same time. So let's hold that thought for a minute. Um, first, I need to say this. There's something being conveyed in verse 2 that when we read it in English, it is slightly misleading. So let me read this again. You know that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Now the problem is when we read as English readers, we would want to change this to the Son of Man will be betrayed and be crucified. That's how we would normally read it if we were reading it in our own frame of reference. Now, the is betrayed, there's two dynamics I want to talk about. Is betrayed is happening in one Greek word, paradidotai. And this is a very interesting compound. What's interesting about it is it's in, in its... Um, in its appearance here in the Greek, it is a verb that is in the present tense, but it is also passive. So it's a verb, indicative, stating a fact, present, now, and passive. So what, what is happening is Jesus is saying the Son of Man, and let's think about that. Is is right. The King James actually did something good here. Is betrayed. The key thing is that the word betray doesn't necessarily convey the whole sum total of what Jesus is saying. Now, let me pause here for a second and abandon this text to help us in the thought processes of understanding this Greek word and how it might be helpful to pause right here. So, this word juxtaposed with, so this word, paradidotai in the Greek, which will occur in John's Gospel um, when it says that Jesus yield his, yielded his spirit. Um, he's on the cross. He breathes out his last, last breath. Um, that's in 1930, uh, where it says, he gave up the ghost. It is finished. Tetelestai. He bowed his head. He gave up the ghost. Now, in the Greek, that is paradidomai. It's the same word we're encountering in Matthew 26. Now, the word can mean a number of things. And there's an anomaly happening in John 19.30. Let me say parenthetically that in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the 
um, accounts where Jesus is yielding up his last breath. There's some interesting words being used there, but they're not the same as John's. So for the sake of making emphasis on our lesson tonight, in Matthew and uh, maybe it's Mark and Luke, we have a word we've encountered before when Jesus yields up his spirit, afiemi, from the same word to release in our, in our text in forgiveness, just to release. He released his spirit. There's another word, ek, ek pnuo, uh, used, I think, in Luke. That is simply, that could be to release, to let go of. In John, when it says he gave up the ghost, he literally, the Greek word, he literally handed over his spirit. That word conveys that, a handing over. Now, it's unique in, in John's Gospel because nowhere in classical literature has this compound, parodidomai, been used of handing over one's spirit. Even in Matthew 26, when it says, King James reads, betrayed, it's still only talking about Jesus being delivered over to somebody else. So I want you to see what this word really represents and, and the anomaly of this. In, I'm using John 20 as an illustration. In John 20, the use of this word, and he gave up the ghost, parudidomai, really highlights, especially for John, what John had chronicled earlier in John 10. No man taketh my life, I lay it down of myself. It really underscores, John understood something in his chronicling, in his way of writing, that we can talk about Judas, and we can talk about Pilate, and we can talk about Herod, and we can talk about Caiaphas, but Jesus was in charge of handing over his spirit at the right time. John 20 or 1930 gives me that uh, ability to state that perfectly and theologically as sound as can be confirming what John declares elsewhere. So, when you come back to Matthew 26, that same word is being used, paradidotai, different uh, declension, but same word. So, he says, and the Son of Man is, and not that betrayed is bad, but I want you to understand that it is, in, in, in essence, to be handed over. So, while this is being said, Look at our English word, is. And the reason that is there and it's right is because the Greek is representing something in the present, in the now. Jesus is saying, the Son of Man is. Now, let's go back to our, our English word for a minute, is betrayed. Essentially, what Jesus is saying is not in a few days from now. The activity is already happening. So. Read that, and then that is the when, when Jesus finished these sayings, he spoke these things. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people under the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus. So you can see here what's going on. They say not at the feast day. That tells you that they were having this discussion before but it also tells you something else about the way this is written. That while Jesus is talking to his disciples two days and then the Passover, and the Son of Man is being handed over or betrayed, what is being said in the grammar is that simultaneous to this discussion with his disciples, this is going on with Caiaphas and the other people. This discussion is, is happening. Do you see that? It's a simultaneous thing. So that's why I said sometimes chronologically we read things. Um, and let me put a footnote on this. This word betrayed can mean treachery, but I want you to really underscore that if you took the para, the, the compound prefix off of the word, and you were left with didomai is usually always to give or to take. So. It, it's carrying a different type of connotation. This is not merely just a word to say turned over or treachery, but essentially this is already being done. Now hold that thought for a minute because this will tie into, remember I said 6 through 16 verses 
6 through 16 and the 26th chapter are an interpolation for the purpose of explaining something else which on the surface is not immediately seen. So, um, we'll come back to this, not quite done, but essentially if I was going to sum this up I'd say in the very hour that Jesus was saying what he's saying in verse 2, the simultaneous happening with these religious leaders gathering. Now don't you find it fascinating that they say, they said not on the feast day. They didn't say not on the feast day because it would be a feast day and therefore it would be something illegal. Not on the feast day out of respect for Yahweh or Yahya or Adnai, but because of the people. It could be an uproar among people. Think about that. Now, there's all these subtleties in here that if you don't stop long enough to appreciate them, you miss a lot. Because this same spirit exists today. People not wanting to do something under the guise of it being religion, but they'll give you a reasoning that's far from the concept of religion, if you will. I even hate to use the word. Now, check this out. Verse 6 is going to pick up somewhere else. There's another when. So in my Bible, I circled when Jesus had finished these sayings, then assembled together the chief priests and so forth. Now, verse 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany, and this is essentially, uh, we're, we're taking a snapshot at something that um, is going to unfold for, for another reason. We might initially think that because we've read this often, it's just an unfolding story, but there's something being made clear here. When Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, poured it on his head as he sat at meat. Now it's commonly referred to as a celebratory meal that he was invited to at the house of Simon the leper. Just entertain that for a minute. Would you like to go have dinner at Simon the leper's house? <laughs> oh look, there's a hand in the dish. Okay. No, can you give me a hand with the dish? All right, sorry, couldn't resist that. Never mind. But I just, you know, you just have to enjoy these things. I don't think it bothers God at all, and if it does, I'll repent later. <laughs> there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment, poured it on his head as he sat at meat. And when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she has wrought a good work upon me. Now, just take a little picture of what I'm saying, because I should have prefaced this by saying that in this 26th chapter, 30, the first 30 verses are a collection of contrasting and some, in some areas, simultaneously happening, but of contrasting attitudes, all pushing to the same place. So it's, a, it's an interesting way to read this chapter. So we have this, obviously the vignette we're familiar with, the woman with the alabaster box and her ointment and the indignation of the disciples, why this waste? Verily I send to you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. Now, in this chapter you're going to read a lot of whens and thens, so here comes another then. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest. So nestled right in here is two pictures, maybe three, but at least two, um, pointing towards the same picture that Jesus said of himself to, to be handed over, to be crucified. He is speaking. Jesus' declaration is moving towards his death, not as uh, a, a bad thing, but what he had foretold, what must happen. Here is this woman commemorating an act, preparing for his burial uh, in selflessness. And here is Judas um, headed off to the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. 
will you give me in exchange for turning over the master, equally leading him towards the cross? Each of these is pointing almost from a different perspective. At the center of this is Christ saying, this must happen. Here we have the woman with her ointment preparing for his burial done in selflessness. We have Judas here. What will you give me in exchange? Here is the selfishness. All characters surrounding Christ, by the way, all pressing in to that moment. The Jews, the religious folks who are conspiring to kill him, all pressing in from different angles. It's kind of an interesting way, as I said, to read this whole chapter. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. I remember I said 6 through 16. And from that time he sought an opportunity to betray him. From that time, which tells you verse 17 picks up at a different time. You can see the discrepancy in the timeline now a little clearer when you pay attention. Because we have a tendency to just read through these things and not pay attention that there's, there's different times going on here. Now, verse 17 now, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus. The question is, where are we going to prepare the Passover? That's kind of interesting. He gives the instructions. And then, as they sat, now they were ready. Now, when even was come, verse 20, it sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. They were exceeding sorrowful and began, every one of them, to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto, woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Now read again in verse 25, Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? I just want you to stop for a minute, because I know you, you are all so familiar with this passage, and I want you to recognize something incarnate evil, possessing the blood money, and sitting at the table. So you've got a dynamic of a bunch of contrasting pictures here, a collection of these. And we know that the rest of it, of course, after, the, after all this, Judas goes out and does his deed. But what I found fascinating as I just began looking at this was a couple of things that I'm, I'm wrestling with how anyone could look at this 26th chapter, or any of these, when you start picking them apart, and you realize it's slightly convoluted. If someone was just setting down to write something, that they would, they would embed these passages like 6 through 16, an interpolation of something. So what was 6, 6 through 16? Explaining about what happened while Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, the vignette here, the interpolation of seeing the woman with the alabaster box, and Judas. And if you carry it all through, Judas covenanting with, uh, for the 30 pieces of silver, and from that time he sought an opportunity to betray him. That's your, that's your interpolation right there. But everything is pressing in to this. Jesus saying what must happen, verse 2. The religious folks conspiring and planning of what must happen in their mind, what they must do. For, they're, they're all looking at the death. They're all, they're all coming at it from different angles. Here's the woman preparing for his burial with the ointment. Here's Judas looking at, how may I profit out of this? And I think the thing that, as I was putting this all together, I realized that there's a couple of things here. One, if a person was just to sit down, why would you insert these interpolations? Furthermore, if you're going to write something, wouldn't you write it out in straight chronological order? If you were fabricating it, wouldn't you write it out in straight chronological order? And then probably out of all this, what I think is somewhat fascinating is I, I was trying to figure out if from looking at this, is there anything that I could glean in here that would help me if I was still building a defense, uh, somebody saying, do you even believe this story is true? Well, here's my question. Maybe Jesus could have control over 
the immediate people around him, including maybe including Judas. Uh, but for example, this woman coming in, or the Jews, at the simultaneous time that Jesus is saying, this indeed is happening at the present moment, and these, this, this is nestled in here, that these are doing this at this present hour, at the same time, you're, you're hard pressed. It would, it's almost like, how could anybody know to weave this in so perfectly and come out with a perfect story, perfectly told? So it left me scratching my head, but it also did something else. It made me realize that this is still happening today in a different dimension. If you think about it, there are people that are, that are pressing in, but not always for the right reason. There'll still be the Judases that come, and they're still, they're still wheeling and dealing how they can profit off of the church, how they can profit off of. There are people that come and give sacrificially. There are still the people, what I call the, cons the religious conspirators, those people that they, they cannot agree with you, they have to find fault with you, you, are not, they don't, you don't fit into their spiritual likings, therefore. But that's, that's so far removed from what's going on inside of this. Now, take a close look again and you realize something. Jesus is not only saying, this is going to happen, but it's down to such crystal clear, maybe Jesus could get lucky one time and say, the third day, and maybe he got lucky and it happened on the third day. He rose from the dead the third day. But there's so many things internally, and that's why I, I highlighted on this one Greek word, that it's, it's impossible one out of ten, maybe, that's lucky. Two out of ten, but every single place where I've turned to analyze the language, the language keeps bringing me back to something. You know, you can look at this book and you can just read it, and then you can pick it apart linguistically, and you realize Jesus is saying things that it's so impossible to be that precise. Simultaneously, as he's saying is in the present, these people are. It's not that it had to happen in two days. They were already working on it already. And the plan, obviously, Judas goes out and conspires with them and takes the money. And he's got the money and he's actually sitting at the table. Is it me, Lord? And believe me, I've met a couple of those in my lifetime in 10 years ministry. Would you just go, oh boy, what if I could only say that? What you do, do quickly. But I think, I think the thing that I'm gleaning out of this is the language is staggering. Now let me step back a little bit and digress to something I pointed out in the message on Sunday. Those texts of the false witnesses, this is why I said the language is important, the texts of the false witnesses. And you have to go to John's Gospel to have exactly what Jesus said because it doesn't appear in Matthew or Mark. There's something interesting even in those twisted sayings of the people who were, who were saying he's speaking of destroying the temple, Herod's temple. If you notice, I wrote on the board two compounds. The false accusers used the word kata. They used the, a prefix in the compound, kata. So what they were saying was utterly and completely destroy. And if you notice Jesus, there was no compound when he said a, a derivative of lucai, to, to just destroy. And even there in the language, you have to kind of step back and say, no, no mortal could fudge this one. What they were accusing, what they were saying he said, which was we know false and aimed in the wrong direction, but the words they were using were utterly, essentially utterly and completely destroy. But what Jesus was saying simply was destroy. He couldn't have used the compound kata to, about himself because what it would have meant is utterly, completely destroy without the possibility of coming back, being resurrected. So it's in the language that you find these incredible proofs where you just have to almost shake your head and say, Okay, you know what? I don't care what language you want to read it in, but when you start analyzing even these, and I chose chapter 26 of Matthew tonight, you realize that it is impossible for someone to have fabricated this and the precision of the things that Christ said. And I just pointed out what John records in John 10, where Jesus is saying, No man taketh my life, but I lay it down of myself. So when he talks about 
being handed over. How do you coordinate these things? How do you manipulate people outside of your control? How do you time being arrested at a right time? Where everything will, is it just the, the stars, everything fell into a perfect place that night? Again, these are all the questions I'm asking, and I'm not asking them to be ridiculous. I'm asking them because if somebody was genuinely saying, well, I don't believe it. And I've met people that just, you know, well, it just, you can't believe anything these people say. Well, I'd almost be inclined to say, have sympathy on the English translators, no matter who tried, because they'll never come close to the reality of the precision of the language. And in that moment, you realize, in this 26th chapter, Jesus declares, movement towards crucifixion and death. Here are the Jews, movement towards killing him, by whatever means. Here is the woman preparing for his death. Here is Judas selling him for his death, betraying him for his death. And all of this is impossibly put together if you analyze the text in all of its grammar, falls into a meticulous place of saying, there is, there's no way out of this. You can't paint it any other way. Um, so I think this analysis tonight will dovetail a little bit for you when you listen to the replay of um, this part one or part two of the resurrection message, and you'll see how important it is to read the text, not only analyzing, like I've done tonight, the thens and the whens, but picking a few select words that basically, even in one chapter, drive you to say it is impossible, not only for this to be a fabrication, but as I get closer and closer to the steps leading me up to Jesus' death on the cross, John's language of him handing over his spirit, who has control of that? Can you tell me who has control of that? Well, at least the Bible has something to say on that wise about controlling that. I'll read it to you. There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. Ecclesiastes 8.8. 8. No one has control over that. So even in the language used in John 19.30, you have to almost shake your head and say, now, either John was a great linguist or he used a specific word understanding exactly what was confirmed afore. We can talk about all these different people and all their parts in bringing Jesus to the cross. But at that moment, he was still laying down his life, very much in charge. And that brings me to a simple point. If he was in charge of his death and in charge of his resurrection, can you not let him take charge of your life and trust him with that? Seems like a very small thing to say, but it's a great challenge for each person who has to walk at times in darkness, forgetting these absolute core truths. This is why we're studying this, to uh, make sure we're, we're fortifying our faith in the right direction. When you've settled that matter, and even when you've settled it, there's some great reassurance, even in the language, to say, well, yeah, I, I need to settle down a little bit. Scripture says, cast my cares upon him because he cares about me, it matters to him. Well, then surely if this is true, then I can cast my cares upon him. I can trust him with my mess and my life and everything else that's ahead of me because he's in control. <laughs> This house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord.